Uh, so uh, today we're going to um, uh, begin our, our journey in um, connecting uh, amplitudes with Grassmannians. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'll introduce the ideas of the, uh, at least the definition, some of the most basic properties of the, of the positive, of the positive Grassmannian, and then we're going to spend a number of lectures, um, we're going to spend a number of lectures exploring them. Uh, so, <coughs> so before talking about the uh, positive Grassmannian, oh, and around 15 minutes into the lecture, we'll have 20 minutes, we'll have enough to, to be able to uh, finish what I promised uh, last time, which is the kind of the one blackboard definition of uh, n equals four super Yang Mills amplitudes to all loop order, <laughs> okay, um, uh, at least in the uh, planar limit. Uh, so that was the peak at the mountains far away, and then we'll, we'll go, go back into the valley as the promise. All right. Um, but let's, uh, let's start with the, just the uh, Grassmannian itself. Uh, the Grassmannian is the space of k-dimensional planes in n dimensions. So the Grassmannian, named after this high school teacher, Mr. Grassman, not even a professor Grassman, okay? uh, the Grassmannian GKN is the space of k-planes through some origin in n dimensions. And this is meant to generalize projective space um, it generalizes Pn minus 1, which you can think of as the space of lines through the origin in n dimensions. Okay, so um, we've been doing a lot of things in projective space, which is the space of lines, uh, but we can th talk more generally about the space of k-planes in n dimensions. Okay, so the first thing to do is to just figure out how we, uh, just the most basic things about this space. So how would you specify, like, let's say, a two-plane in seven dimensions? Okay, to, to specify a k-plane in n dimensions, I just have to give you k n-dimensional vectors, right? And the span of those vectors is, uh, uh, is the plane. All right, so, uh, so, uh, so I'd have some a vector v1, up to some vector vk. This is in an n-dimensional space. All right, and so the span of those vectors is giving me the uh, k-plane. And how would I represent this uh, in formulas? Uh, well, I would just give you the vector v1 and then the vector v2 up to vk. If I stack them together, uh, I have a k by n matrix. Okay. Now I'm going to call these k by n matrices uh, just 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 so you know uh, ahead of time. There are going to be many Grassmannians. <laughs> We're going to run into many Grassmannians in our study of uh, amplitudes. There'll be some Grassmannians just in the external kinematical space. We'll just see in a moment that even points in space-time, interpreted in twister space, can be thought of as points in g two comma four. Okay. Uh, we'll have some internal Grassmannians. We'll have all, all Grassmannians all over the place. Um, so just get, uh, get used to that. But for, for a little while, I'm going to call all of our, uh, most of our Grassmannians by the symbol C. Okay? So, it's, uh, so this matrix I'm going to label as C alpha A. And alpha will run from 1 to K. The row index in A will run from 1 to N. All right. So if someone hands you a k by n matrix, they've handed you, uh, if someone's handed you a k by n matrix, they've handed you some k plane in n dimensions. However, um, that's not unique. Two people can hand you two different k by n matrices, but the, the actual plane is the same. And so uh, what, what, do you have to, uh, what do you have to identify? Um, well, what you have to identify is if someone else chose to make some random linear combination <laughs> of your k vectors to make another set of k vectors, the plane doesn't change. Okay? So there's an identification that we have to make. We want to identify C alpha A with any k by k linear transformation on the alpha index. Okay, so this is a GLK 
redundancy, like a gauge invariant, which generalizes the GL1 that we had for projective space, right? So where we got to just rescale uh, everything. <coughs> okay. So, um, so right away, we can figure out what is a, uh, a, uh, what is the dimensionality of the Grossmannian. Um, the uh, dimensionality of GKN is what? Um, well, uh, how many degrees of freedom are there in a K by N matrix? There's K times N. But there's the GLK redundancy, which is K by K. Okay, so... Uh, so this is just the k, k by n matrix. This is the GLK redundancy. And so this number is k times n minus k. Right, so that's the dimensionality of the uh, Grossmannian. Again, when k equals 1, we're back to uh, projective space. Okay, so, so um, g of 1 comma n is just p n minus 1. All right, now, um, let's think more concretely how we'd write down, you know, uh, how we'd write down uh, k times n minus k coordinates. Uh, how do we do it in projective space? So in p n minus 1, um, I give you some n vector. And for example, I can rescale the top component to be 1. And then I have sort of x1 through xn minus 1, right? Or let me, so in order to keep the notation consistent now, let me say I could put something to 1 here. And then the rest I would put to like c2 up to c, um, uh, up to cx. OK? So I'd have an n, uh, I'd have an n dimensional, a 1 by n matrix. Uh, and I, we, we just rescale the top component to 1. I do a gauge fixing to rescale the top component to 1. And recall this gauge fixing doesn't cover the entire projective space. They're all the places where the top component is 0, and we have to cover them uh, elsewhere. So there, there's not one chart that covers all of the projective space. OK, what is the analog of this for the Grossmannian? Well, it's just that I can take my k by k linear transformation freedom. And you can just think of those k by k linear transformations that are sort of acting on the left on this matrix, on this k by n matrix, right? So I can use that k by k linear transformation to set any k by k block of this k by n matrix to the identity that I like. Just multiply by the inverse of anything that I see in any, uh, I take any k of the columns, I take the sub matrix I get there, and I multiply by its, by its inverse. I don't have to stack them all at the start. OK, but, um, but uh, uh, for fun, uh, uh, for GKN, um, there's, uh, there's a gauge fixing where my, uh, where my matrix, so this was my matrix C, which is just a 1 by n matrix. But more generally, my, my k by n matrix C would look like, let's say, 1, 1, 1, some k by k identity block. And then everything else is uh, everything else is free. Okay. So, for instance, if I'm doing, um, I don't know, G three five. I have a 3 by 5 matrix that I can make look like 1, 0, 0. I can put the identity block here. And then let's say x4, y4, z4, x5, y5, z5. OK? Is that clear? And I can put that identity block anywhere I like. They don't have to be consecutive columns. right? I can put it anywhere I like. So here are my uh, six degrees of freedom. Okay, So uh, x4, y4, z4, x5, y5, z5 have six degrees of freedom. And 6, indeed, is equal to k times n minus k. All right? OK. Now, um, some more basic facts about the uh, Grassmannian. Uh, you'll notice the formula for the dimensionality has an obvious symmetry, exchanging k and n minus k. 
And what is the reason for that? Well, because there's an obvious, uh, there's an obvious bijection uh, between two different Grossmannians, k planes in n dimensions and n minus k planes in n dimensions. If I give you a k plane in n, in n dimensions, I've automatically also given you an n minus k plane in n dimensions. Who is it? It's the plane orthogonal to the first one. <laughs> okay, so if I give you the plane C, I've also given you the plane C perp. Okay, so if C is a k plane in n dimensions, then it fixes, and then back and forth, C perp, which is an n minus k plane in n dimensions. And in one of these gauge fixings, it's extremely easy to explicitly write down that other matrix. So in this case, C perp would be a two plane in five dimensions. And how do I make, uh, how do I make that uh, two plane? Well, I just do the following. So I just write this now big five by five matrix. One, 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 one. Uh, and here I have uh, x4, x5, y4, y5, z4, z5. And here I just put its uh, negative, its transpose, right? So negative x4, negative y4, negative z4, negative x5, negative y5, negative z5. OK, so this top matrix is C, and this bottom matrix is C perp. OK, so you see how precisely the uh, uh, the uh, data of one feeds into the data of the other. Okay, so if you have a k plane n dimension, you determine a k minus, an n minus k plane, and so clearly, all the rows of this matrix are orthogonal uh, to the ones of those sets. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, the way it's said it here, it seems to need a, uh, a metric. I've, I've written it in a way that it's literally orthogonal. Now this is in, not in the, this is in the, in the direction of the n, uh, it's a metric in the n-dimensional space, right? But really, it's an upstairs, downstairs thing. So it's, uh, but yeah, just, just for simplicity, think about it just as, uh, as, 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 as an, that's right. That's right. That, that, so that's really the point. There's actually no metric involved here. Okay. So really, really, it's a statement that if you take a minor. So I, I'm coming to this in a moment. I'm just saying it sort of uh, just so you think about it. Uh, just exactly. Exactly. That's right. So 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 uh, uh, exactly. C purpose is, is the part of the whole giant space that's not in C. Okay. Um, this is, uh, in these gauge fixings, you see it more intuitively as something that's literally orthogonal, but more, more invariantly, it's the part of the big space that is not in C. What you're left with after you project through a T. Okay, and, and we'll, we'll say it in a more GLN uh, invariant way in a second. So it doesn't actually involve a, a metric notion. All right, now, okay, so now uh, comes the more interesting question. So what are, what are objects, what can we talk about? So if someone hands you, uh, if someone hands you a k by n matrix, um, uh, in order to make sure that you're just talking about the plane, anything you do with that matrix should be GLK invariant. So let's begin life by talking about what the SLK invariants are. So the SLK invariants are just, I take any k columns of this matrix and I take a determinant, right? So those are, are, those are our minors. So I would call them CA1 through CAK, or sometimes I might call them, I might forget about the Cs and just uh, label them by the uh, indices. Okay? Okay, so these are the SLK invariants. And therefore the GLK invariants are just ratios of minors. Okay, so I can take A1 through AK over B1 through BK. These are the these are the kinds of things I'm allowed to uh, talk about. So if, if someone hands you, if two people hand you a matrix and you want to see are they the same or not, um, uh, you don't explicitly, it's not so hard to do, but you don't explicitly have to find the transformation that maps one to the other. All you've got to do is compute the minors of the one matrix, the minors of the other matrix, and see if the minors are proportional to each other. So the ratios have to all, all be the same. Okay? 
Now, since these minors are the invariants, you might wonder, why don't we just talk about, why don't we just work with the minors directly instead of talking about this k by n matrix? And you can do that, but this is the entire rub of the matter and the entire thing that makes the story of the Grassmannian, the positive Grassmannian, so interesting, um, is that these minors satisfy nonlinear relations. They're not all independent variables. They satisfy nonlinear non relations, and we've seen them already. It's just those Plucker relations that we had talked about. So uh, remember, we have relations that look like C k plus 1, and then uh, C1 through Ck, right? So, so if this is a vector, I take any k plus 1 vectors, and if I look at this combination, right, so minus, uh, 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 minus uh, uh, Ck, C1 dot dot, Ck minus 1, Ck plus 1, plus minus, et cetera, is equal to 0, right? So this was our, uh, this was our, the schouten pluka relationship, Kramer. All right, so that's a statement at the level of the vectors. And so I can make a statement at the level of the minors if I just contract everything here with any k minus 1 uh, c's that I like. Okay, so, so all the statements then are of the form um, j1 through j k minus 1, i k plus 1, i1 through i k. And then you take all of these guys and you anti-symmetrize through these guys that that is equal to 0. Okay, so there's a quadratic relationship between all of these minors. These are known as the Plucker relations. Literally, these are known as the Plucker relations. So if you want to talk about, uh, if you want to uh, talk directly in terms of the invariance, that's fine, but you're living on this constrained quadratic surface, okay, uh, with these quadratic constraints on the, uh, on the variables. Or you can work in terms of some underlying k by n matrix, which guarantees that this is true. Okay, but then when you work into the in terms of the k by n matrix, you have to make sure you're only talking about minors. You have a GLK redundancy. Okay? Is that clear? All right. They're all compact. Yeah. They're all they're all they're all compact. Uh, yeah, because uh, what, 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 what makes it compact is the same thing as what makes projective space compact in the end. All we ever care about are ratios. So these, these, are, the, these, are, the, uh, 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 these are relations between the minors, but we care about only ratios. Of so if you like, um, say, if I said it another way, there's a, we're not going to talk about this very much, but we'll occasionally talk about it. There's something called the Plucker embedding. where you really think of GKN, GKN lives inside this giant projective space, P of n choose k minus 1. Okay, there's a total of n choose k minors. Okay, uh, just choose any k of the columns. So in this giant projective space lives a quadric surface. Okay, so uh, so in, in, in P n choose k minus 1, there is a quadric um, uh, defined by the Plucke relations. So that's another way of talking about the. Uh, that's another way of talking about the. Uh, Rasmani. Okay, but um, we will almost always be talking sort of practically about concrete matrices. Okay, so it's not. Uh, uh, Oh, this is just a, this is a, everything that's in a parentheses or a bracket of any sort, um, uh, unless it appears to multiply some expression, <laughs> is a minor or is something where you contract everything with the epsilon symbol. Okay, so so uh, so so let me write this explicitly in this case. So this is some C alpha one a one, C alpha k a k. Right? The A's are the indices that run from 1 to n. The alphas run from 1 to k. Epsilon alpha 1 through alpha k. Right? So that's the minor that we're talking about. Sometimes I'll put it in a bracket. Sometimes I'll put the C's. 
Sometimes I won't. This is just the notational device. So if I write if I write an expression like one three five, I have in mind some three by something matrix, and I'm taking the minor uh, where I take the columns one three five, and I take the determinant. Okay, all right. So let's look at our first interesting example of a Grassmannian that is not a projective space, and that's a G24. You might think it's G23, because there's two, but remember, G23 is the same as G13, so G, G23 is really just uh, P2 again. So the first new example is G24. And uh, let's uh, uh, right away talk about some coordinates for it. So here are some coordinates for it. Just for fun, it'll be useful for me later. I have four columns, one, two, three, four. And I'm going to choose the gauge fix one and three to be one, zero, and zero, one. And then two and four will be some x, y, z, w. I'm not being very careful about how I write this. OK. Um, in this case, uh, what is our Plucker relation? We just have a single Plucker relation. Uh, just a single, which is, again, our fav favorite formula, which I'm writing in a, just rewriting in a slightly different way, which will be useful for different purposes. So now we have six variables, right? So let's just do our counting. It's a two by four matrix. We have four choose two equals six minors, right? Um, and uh, so, but we have the single relation. And so if you want to think about it in the Plucker embedding, these six minors just give you some six vector up to rescaling. So they live in P5. And in P5, there's this, just this one quadric surface. Okay, so everything that lives on this quadric surface in P5 is G24. OK? Or we can just think directly in terms of this uh, 2 by 4 matrix. So um, I mentioned that, we're th that, they're, that Grassmannians are everywhere. So uh, let me just make a little aside for a moment just to say that we've seen G24 before. Okay, we've already seen G24 a number of times when we talked about the twister representation of points in space-time. Okay, so if you remember, um, G24 is also the same as the fact that lines in twister space are points in space-time. So let's remember how that worked. So remember, we said that if you have an A and a B in P3, that we want to care about the line that's made by uh, A and B. In fact, we describe that by saying that there is this anti-symmetric combination. That this gives me a line in, uh, that that gives me a line in P3, right? But another way of saying this is that I've given you one four-dimensional vector A. I'm now stacking them horizontally. I've given you another four-dimensional vector A. And anything I do with this 2 by 4 matrix had better be invariant under 2 by 2 linear transformations, which is just telling me I can move A and B along the line, keeping AB fixed. OK? So we've already seen G24 before. So, uh, and when we say that, that, that points in space time are lines in uh, twister space, what we're really giving you is points in G24. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, correspondence. That's why you have the outer space and the yeah, and, and then, then there's everything uh, after that. But, uh, but here we're just, uh, uh, I'm just, uh, just, just making a connection with other things that, that, that we've seen before. That when we're talking about uh, this connection between points in space-time and lines in twister space, we're really also just talking about something in G24. All right. Um, now, let me just, uh, uh, this is, uh, you can take or leave this. This is, everyone has their own favorite way of uh, remembering all these relations and thinking about them. Um, 
But uh, I just want to give you, uh, uh, so this is a little aside for a second. Um, uh, there are, the Grassmannian is naturally acted on, so GKN is naturally acted on by GLK. This is our redundancy, so we're modding out by this. In other words, we're identifying two different points which are related by GLK transformation and by GLN. Okay, so I have a N. I can just do any linear transformations I like. And if I do that, I get some other uh, K by N matrix. And so you might want to think about things in a way where the actions of GLK and GLN are manifest. We're not going to be using this uh, much Partially because in almost all of our applications, the GLN symmetry is sort of going to be broken. We're going to give columns. I mean, we've already been tacitly doing it. Column one, column two, column three, right? Um, in other words, we don't just have k planes and n dimensions. We have k planes and n dimensions with n preferred directions. <laughs> that, that, that lets me talk about what I mean by column one, two, three, four, and so on. So I don't actually care about general GLN transformations. The subgroup of GLN we will be caring about is the cyclic shift, right? Because remember, we, uh, in, in a lot of the things that we're talking about, there's an ordering on the external particles. So, so uh, that will be reflected in a cyclic action. We don't care about the full GLN action. But anyway, this is just a, so this is just an, an aside, but it's useful uh, for some things, and it might help you remember. So I just want to describe things so that those, uh, those those symmetries become a little more obvious. So there's a graphical notation uh, which is useful. This kind of notation shows up all over the place. People who play with uh, tensor networks draw them. Uh, Moose model builders uh, in particle physics uh, 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 drew them. Um, Penrose drew them in his book, sort of more, more complicated versions of these pictures. But anyway, this is really simple. Instead of drawing a matrix, um, I'm just going to represent, so I have the C alpha A. So I think about this as a vector, as, in, uh, as, a, 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 as something that transforms under the GLN. This is something that transforms under the GLK. So I'll just represent it with, let's say, outgoing arrows when the indices are downstairs. OK? So um, uh, the only point of the next three minutes is so you don't have to remember formulas where you contract epsilon tensors in complicated ways. It's just a slightly amusing thing. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make the comment uh, in, a, in, in a few minutes. All right, so what can I do with this guy? Well, for example, uh, I can contract k of the indices here. If I contract k of the indices, uh, I'll get a minor. And the minor will therefore be an anti-symmetric uh, tensor with k arrows coming out. Okay, so what I can do is make, maybe I'll put in a square to remind me that it's a minor. Now the k indices are gone, but now this is going to have k arrows going out. Is that clear? Alpha is running from 1, one to k. So alpha is running from 1 to k. So this is a is runs from 1 to n, but this guy was just a fundamental under GL1. And when I anti-symmetrically contract k of them, I get a k-fold anti-symmetric tensor. Okay? Just like we did here, right? I, have a, I wrote as an a and a b, but the anti-symmetric contraction of these guys gives me an anti-symmetric tensor under the, under the GL4. OK, well, but under GLN, there is also, you can also turn all the indices downstairs. You can, do, uh, you can contract with a giant epsilon symbol to bring any number of indices uh, upstairs to n minus that number of indices downstairs. So let's call that guy uh, C dual. Okay, so this is just the same thing, but now at least the arrows are going out. This is going to be uh, n minus k arrows going in. OK? So for instance, in this way of doing things, the Aplica relations are a very nice formula which are manifestly GLN invariant and GLK, everything GLN and GLK invariant, the, the Plucker relations 
is just that if I take C, I can even leave an alpha out if I like. I can further contract them later. But if I just if I leave this uh, index, and I just eat up one of them with C dual, that that's equal to 0. Okay? So you can nicely convince yourself that that's, that that's true. So why is that? Because in Fluker, remember, we're anti-symmetrizing with respect to all those indices, k plus 1, 1, 1 through k, k plus 1. Since I'm anti-symmetrizing with respect to all of them, it's exactly the same as, uh, as contracting the last index of the of uh, alpha with the dual of what I would get from uh, just raising everything with the uh, epsilon symbol. Okay? So this is the Aplucker relation. So, and this way of writing it makes all the symmetries manifest. So the GLK action is manifest, and the fact that it's GLN invariant is also manifest. Okay? Of course, uh, you can also just stare at these formulas and convince yourself if you do any n by n linear transformation, you just get exactly the same identities back. It's sort of obviously true, but, um, uh, but this graphical notation is a way of making that clear. All right, let's keep going. <coughs> so that's, that's, the, uh, that's an aside. Um, now I want to talk about uh, all the things that we've done on projective space. I want to learn how to do on Grassmannians. So let's talk about forms on Grassmannians and actually top forms on Grassmannians. OK, so remember on Pn minus 1 or G1n, um, we wrote down forms that look like, in this language now, before we call them x, now we can call them c. Uh, we, we, we wrote down for forms that look like c, dc, dc. times anything that had weight minus n in C. So I want to figure out what is the analog of this. OK? And uh, what, was the, what was the point? That if C was just, if I gauge fix it to just be 1 uh, and uh, uh, C2 up to Cn, then uh, this measure then this omega, uh, so if I call this omega 1n, this omega 1n just became the obvious dc2 up to dcn in that gauge fixing. We also wrote down, uh, we said more loosely that we can write down omega 1n as d1 times nc mod gl1. So it's just, I have this 1 by n matrix, but I'm just modding out by the overall GL1. So I want to find the analog of that for the Grassmannian. And so first of all, it's obvious what it has to be. Um, so dk times nc mod glk, that's what I'm trying to figure out. What is the analog now? I'm modding out, I have a k by n matrix, not a 1 by n matrix, and I want to figure out what this means. Um, once again, if I do a gauge fixing, uh, if C goes to some identity block here, and then there's some C alpha i for the rest, then I know that this thing should go to, should equal just the product of the DC alpha i for all of them. Okay, so that's the, that's the analog of what, what we saw before. Okay, so, that's, so that, that defines it. <laughs> Okay, so I've defined what it is in, in any chart. Uh, and, and so you can, you can go from one chart to the other and write it down in any chart that you like. You might want to know what the analog of this formula is. And this you almost never need uh, to write it this way. But every now and then, it's useful to know it. Um, so I want to tell you. Uh, uh, how you write down uh, uh, omega, so 
this is this, so let's call this omega k and n. So omega k and n um, is also determined by local GLK invariance. Remember, that's what determined the structure of the form we had for, for projective space, is that we want it to be invariant under C, not just goes to TC, but goes to T of C times C, right? And that's what forced these DCs all to be contracted in with C in order for the inhomogeneous part of that transformation to uh, go to zero. Well, exactly the same thing is, is true here. And there, there are many ways of writing uh, the uh, final answer. Um, but uh, this is a way that, again, makes all the symmetries manifest. The GLK and the GLN invariants of this form manifest. And so this is, uh, this is the way I like to write it. So let's go back to the, that's really the only purpose of introducing this notation. So I'm going to take all k of the dc's and wedge them all together. Okay, so if I take k of the dc's and wedge them together, I can call it d to the kc. And so that's just going to have k lines going out. All right, so I just do this many times. So I, draw, I just draw this picture many times, d to the kc, k lines going out. How many times should I draw it? Well, I'm looking for a k times n minus k form, so I'm going to draw n minus k of these things. All right. Now on the other side, I'm going to draw c duals. The c dual, each one, has n minus k lines. There are n minus k lines. There are k lines coming out here. So I'm going to put n minus k lines coming in. And I'm going to plonk down k of these. And now what do I do with the lines? Just contract them all. Just draw the complete graph, where I contract all the indices on one side with all the lines on the other. Okay, That is the form like this with that. So each one, like this one, has got to go to n minus k places. So just take one from there, 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 there. Similarly for all of them. OK? Just the complete graph on these guys is the form. Now, why is this the form? Because this beautifully makes it manifest that it's locally GLK invariant. <laughs> when you do a local GLK transformation, C goes to now some general GLK transformation times C. Now, the part that you worry about, just like we had for, uh, for the case of projective space, is when you take a DC and you replace it with a C. All right, But in any one of these places, when I take a DC and I replace it with a C, what's going to happen? It'll vanish because it's contracted into some C dual on the other side, and those are exactly the Plucker relations. Okay. All right, so this is the invariant way of writing the form. As I said, you will hardly ever uh, explicitly need to use that formula, but it's useful to know that it exists. Um, and I just want to make a parenthetical comment that the, the uh, of course, I don't have to draw this picture. Of course, I can just write some formula with a lot of DCs and Cs and epsilon symbols. But when you do that, you have, uh, you have to keep track of where all the indices are contracting and all these bunch of epsilons on one side and who they're contracting on the other side. And when you do that long enough, you realize that this is a totally non-invariant artifact of the fact that human beings 2,000 years ago decided to write on lines on a sheet of paper. <laughs> right? When you write on lines on a sheet of paper, the kind of relationships that you can easily capture have a certain planarity to them. <laughs> okay? So when you, when you contract indices and so on, um, uh, really, there's some graph like this involved, which is telling you how all the indices are contracted. When the graphs are very simple, when they're linear, or at least when they have a planar structure, the kind of what the index contraction looks like on a line is simple. In this case, it's just a very non non-planar graph. And so it's a very bad idea to write it down on, on a straight line, because you're sort of scrunching all the information of this uh, genuinely non-planar graph into a straight line, because people uh, started uh, writing on pieces of paper 2,000 years ago. Okay? So anyway, th so there are some things that are better represented as graphs, not just because it's cute or it's more fun, 
uh, uh, or maybe easier to remember, but there's, it's reflecting something invariant about the kind of objects that you're building and the nature of the, of the invariants, which don't uh, necessarily have a simple planar structure. End of uh, comment. Okay, so, um, yeah. Yes. No, there's not. And uh, out of C is coming out. Uh, out of C is coming out. Uh, uh, out of literally the C that I drew, it has an alpha just coming in one line. This thing has n minus k lines. Okay. Uh, and so there's one of them being contracted. There's n minus k minus one left on the other side. Right. All right. So um, let's just do an example now. Uh, an example on G24. Okay, so, um, and let me actually, uh, let me think about G24 just because it's, we've seen it in the context, I, I'll, I can write in terms of C's, but let me write it uh, uh, this way because that's the context that we saw it uh, earlier. So what is this formula? This formula would say it's DA, DB, DA, DB, and then AB dual is just the AB with indices downstairs. I can put the dual there if I like. But, okay, so it's just this, which is just AB DA DB squared. Okay, where squared means everything is being wedged. All right, so now let's do a little application. So before we get into these more abstract forms, I just, uh, uh, just abstractly in Westmanians, I want you to see that they're related to things that you know and love. Um, so let's uh, let's come and, and talk about um, just just an, an application. Uh, let's talk about loop integrands. So we may have talked about this a little bit before. Uh, but let's say you have, uh, uh, even if you know just a tiny bit about field theory, certainly if you've taken a field theory course, uh, you might run into a diagram that looks like that. So four external particles, everything massless, a box diagram like this. We talked about this perhaps already once, that the conventional way of doing this would be to put some L here, and then there would be some L plus P1, L plus P1 plus P2, maybe L minus P4. And so there's, there's a form associated with this guy, which is D4L. This is what you're going to integrate over L squared, L plus P1 squared, L plus P1 plus P2 squared, and L minus P4 squared. OK? So we're going to do a few things with this first. First, we're going to, and this is, this is possible and easy for any planar graph. Okay, we're going to use better variables to describe this that don't ask me to like make this artificial choice of who's L and so on. So what is it that we're doing after all, whenever we have this ordering, see the planarity matters, because they have to have an ordering on the external lines. But when I do that, let's draw what these dual points would have been. Okay, so uh, I would call this point uh, uh, X1 in here. And this would be X4, X2, and x3, right? So this is a this is a polygon that we've been talking about uh, for a long time now, right? Okay, so this is our polygon that when we go to a momentum twister space, we even uh, uh, trivialize, right, by by making the manifest we have a null polygon. But now instead of talking about a loop variable, I should just add a fourth point, x naught. So what I'm doing is putting a point in the center of all these faces. So here's a point in the center of this space. And so uh, each one of these propagators, so instead of L squared, L just turns into x naught minus x1 squared. L plus p1 squared becomes x naught minus x2 squared, and so on. So already this is much more, much more beautiful. Uh, my, my form becomes. Uh, my form becomes just d four x naught over x minus x one squared, x minus x four squared. Okay. 
So far, so good? All right. But now let's go one step further. Uh, we know that we can think about all of these things uh, in, in the momentum twister space instead. And what does x naught become? x naught becomes a line AB, right? Points in space-time becomes lines in uh, twister space. So what should this form look like? So omega should be, well, something should be this top form on AB space. So let me write it in this way, d4za, d4zb mod gl2. Right? This is just d2 times 4 of that za, zb matrix mod gl2. And let's see what the rest of it looks like. What does x minus x1 squared look like? Well, remember, uh, this is something which is going to go to 0 when x is null separated from x1. So that is a pole that looks like, so downstairs I'll have something that looks like ab12, ab23, up to ab41. OK? And notice that nicely the weights in a and b cancel. There are four ab's downstairs. There are four ab's upstairs. And now what do I have to do to make the weights in 1, 2, 3, 4 cancel? Well, there's just some factor of 1, 2, 3, 4 squared. Okay, so now this is a form that makes sense on momentum twister space. Okay. The novelty is that now we're, instead of thinking about d4x as points in space time, we're now thinking about this as a form on g24 instead. A form on the space of lines in momentum twister space. OK? All right, but let's see what the payoff is. Um, in thinking in this way, we're immediately going to learn something about this form that was not at all obvious uh, in, in any of the ways. I mean, people have written down this box integrand for 50 years without noticing this simple fact. Okay, So uh, the simple fact I'm just about to uh, tell you. Um, OK, so let's, let's actually work out what this form is. So it's convenient. Let's, let's gauge fix conveniently. So um, uh, I can even, so, so I can, I can uh, gauge fix the uh, GL2 uh, by, by, by saying that A is like, so let me actually uh, uh, say it like this. Uh, I could use the, I could use um, the GL4 symmetry on the on the on on the P3 uh, to set uh, Z1 through Z4 just equal to the identity matrix. Okay, so that's uh, that's one simple thing. And then I'm going to just gauge fix my matrix AB uh, so this is a 2 by 4 matrix and I'll gauge fix it in one of the ways that I just talked about I'm just going to be sloppy later in a moment we'll be a, well we'll be slightly more cunning in how we uh, write things down but anyway here we don't need to be so I'm just going to uh, gauge fix in this simple way all right, so what is D4ZA, D4ZB mod GL2 is just DX, DY, DZ, DW. Okay? And now all we have to do is compute AB12, AB23, and so on, right? So what is AB12? Remember, Z1 and Z2 have been set to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. So AB12 is just the 3, 4 minor of this matrix. Okay, so AB12, so if I, if I say it more, more pedantically, um, what I've done in, in doing this, had I not gauge fixed Z1 through Z4 to this convenient form, all this is doing is saying that A is Z1 plus xz2 plus wz4, and b is z3 plus 
yz2 plus little z, z4. OK? And so I, now I can just compute what is AB12. OK, well, if it's AB12, I can't take the, uh, um, uh, I have to, so because there's a 1 and a, and, and a 2 sitting there, this part of A will just cancel out. So I can uh, forget about that. A has a Z4 in it, so the Z4 part of B will cancel out. So this is just equal to uh, W times 1, 2, 3, 4, which I've set equal to 1 there. Okay. So, But if I do this expansion, then so AB23 is the complementary Again, the 2, 3 is the complementary minor of this matrix. It's z times 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, which I've just set he here equal to 1. Okay, so a, b, 3, 4 is y, and a, b, 4, 1 is x. And therefore, we conclude that this form is equal to dx, dy, dz, dw over x, y, z, w. Totally amazing. Okay? This form collapsed into 4d log. Right? This is d log x, d log y, d log z, d log w. This simple little box integral is a form of logarithmic singularities. Okay? And um, so that's what the twistorial way of thinking about things buys for us. Now I can write that more manifestly. I can solve for x, y, z, and w in terms of, uh, so I can, I, can, I can write this also more invariantly as d log of a, b, 1, 2 over a, b, <coughs> 2, 4. d log ab41 over ab24. Okay. And by the way, I could replace this 2, 4 also by 1, 3 and get exactly the same answer. Okay? Up to a sign. Okay, so, so omega is this, and I, if I replace 2, 4 with 1, 3, uh, I, I'll get uh, negative omega. Now, um, let me try to explain. Let's try to reinterpret this back in, uh, this is actually related to one of the things on your problem set, on your previous problem set, but I just want to explain what it is that this uh, way of thinking about things is uh, buying for you here. We can, of course, write this back Back in terms of original, in the, uh, back in terms of the original variables. Let's say in terms of the original x variables. Well, so this just says that it looks like d log, and the numerators are simple: x minus x one squared, d log x minus x two squared, to d log x minus x four squared. But who are these denominators? There's some kind of funny point. I'll call it x star. So that point x star corresponds to either 2, 4, or 1, 3. Okay, so x star can either correspond to the line 2, 4, z2, z4, or z1, z3. Well, let's see what's special about these. So <coughs> remember, I have my, in twister space, I have z1, z2, momentum twister space, z3, and z4. We have to imagine this as a three-dimensional picture. They're not all, all in a plane, okay, but one, but uh, we're just drawing where we have these lines. So this corresponds to the point x1, the point x2, the point x3, and the point x4. But now there's a natural question you can ask here, which is the question asked in your problem set. Um, is there some other point, x star, 
which is null separated from all of x1, x2, x3, x4. Okay, now that's a question, again, you'll ask it on your problem set, but uh, we can kind of visualize in Minkowski space, it's not so hard to visualize uh, what points there are that are null separated from four given points, and sort of how to think about it. Okay? But you're immediately thinking quadratic equations, somehow, right? Because one way or another, there's a light code involved, there's a quadratic constraint involved. All of these problems turn into classic, simple problems in, in the geometry of P3 without any, without any, um, uh, with, with, with no metric. So now instead of asking for a line that inter uh, for a point that's not separated from all four points, what am I asking? I'm asking for a line that intersects all four of these lines. One, two, two, three, three, four, and four, one. I want to know, is there, is there such a line and how many of them are there? And who are the points that intersect all four lines? There are exactly two of them. One, three, and two, four. Okay. Those are the two lines that intersect all four. Okay. This is the first problem in the Schubert calculus, what's known as the Schubert calculus. Just the, and you can actually make it more general. You will explore the more general problem on your problem sets. If you have any of four lines in general position in P3, there are two lines that intersect all four. But the point is that this way of thinking just hands them to us. We don't even have to think. We don't have to sort of imagine, whereas the problem is, if you think in Minkowski space, those are complex points. <laughs> They're funny points. We're not used to thinking about a point that's not separated from all the, all the four of the points in our problem. If we were used to thinking about it, it might have been natural to write down, to make a guess for a form like this. After all, you look at that and you say, look, it has four poles. Maybe it's four d logs. But oops, that's nonsense, because something's got to make up for the units. There's no other points in town. I don't know if there's any other points. OK, I give up. You would have to think, no, maybe there is some special points that are null separated from all four. And that might be the thing that goes downstairs. So that, that's quite a lot of imagination, right? Whereas when you work, uh, when you think in terms of twister space, it just falls out. You don't have to think. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one of the concrete senses in which uh, uh, the momentum twister aspect of the geometry makes life easier. But at the moment, I was just uh, using this to illustrate how we work with these forms in uh, on the Grassmannian, these forms on G24. OK? Um, and so the, the loop integrand, the loop integrand is at one loop is a four form. OK? Now comes actually another uh, important point. Since we're talking about loop integrands, this is uh, uh, a good place to say it. We have, haven't said anything about loop corrections um, uh, so far in this course, but uh, and we'll say a lot more about it. But for the moment, what I want to emphasize is a very simple but very important point, um, which is that there is such a thing as the loop integrand in planar theories. In, in theories where I have uh, only summing planar diagrams. So what do I mean? Let's say. I have some sort of arbitrary complicated theory. Maybe I have uh, two loops. I have a picture that looks like this. Maybe I have some more complicated picture that looks like this, uh, and so on. Okay. So you just draw very complicated pictures. Um, but you want to imagine that uh, you're not doing the loop integrals yet. You want to add up all the Feynman diagrams first, just like a tree level. We can add up all the Feynman diagrams first so we get some rational function. Here I could add up all of the, uh, I could try to see, does it make sense to add up all the loop diagrams? And um, um, leave to the end the process of doing the integration. And very naively, this is nonsense. Actually, very naively, even before getting to the planar limit, this is nonsense. Let's say I have this diagram and this diagram. Let's say, I wanna, I say I'm adding these two diagrams. What could it possibly mean to add these two diagrams? In the completely boneheaded, obvious way of thinking about things, I'd have to say, well, here is the momentum L. So I get some function here that depends on L. But here, what's L? There's some other L. Maybe, maybe I'm going to call this thing L. So there does not seem to be any 
canonical way to even identify what I mean by the loop variables from graph to graph to graph. And that puts a cramp on imagining there's some master object that's sort of combining them all, all together. It's just this very basic labeling fact. Okay? What do you mean by the loop variable? Now, here, even if you want to work in conventional language, you can say, well, there is something. After all, I could say this L is the loop momentum that's flowing from 1 in the direction of 2. So maybe I could go back in this picture and say that if, the, if this is 1 and 2, that maybe I should, uh, I, should, uh, I should label L the same way here, say. OK? Um, but this is still not very invariant. What is invariant, and you can always do this in a planar theory, what is invariant is if you work with these, uh, if you imagine that your loop variables are points in this space time instead. See, just like what we saw before, that completely removed the ambiguity in how I labeled L. The loop momenta were just x0 minus x1 squared, x0 minus x2 squared, and so on. So in this example, let's say I have some x0 and y0. Okay? Then I could put some x0 and y0 here. And it's completely canonical, what I mean. Right? Here I would write down. Here I would write down for example, for the first graph, I'd write down d4 x naught, d4 y naught over, and then the the first guy has x naught minus x naught minus x1, x2, x3, and x4 are the points inside here. So I'd have x0 minus x1 squared, x0 minus x2 squared, x0 minus x3 squared. Then in y, y would talk to x4, right? So it would be y0 minus x3 squared, y0 minus x4 squared, y0 minus x1 squared. And there would also be this internal propagator, which is just x0 minus y0. Okay, so that's what I could mean by the first diagram. Okay? And of course, I should symmetrize in x0 and y0. It's totally arbitrary how I decided to label x0 and y0. Okay, so, so plus symmetrize in flipping x0 and y0. But then the second diagram has exactly the same variables. So it's completely canonical how to combine everything together. Okay? Here, it really matters that you had planar graphs. And if you did not have planar graphs, there is not such an obvious canonical way to combine, the, uh, to, uh, combine things uh, anymore. All right, and again, um, it might not be, uh, by the way, uh, uh, it just came and went, but um, it may not have been obvious to you ahead of time that that one loop diagram that we talked about was actually dual conformal invariant. We just saw by writing in the momentum switcher space that it's dual conformal invariant. That's, that's, uh, so that's this hidden dual conformal symmetry is actually sitting there when we write it in momentum twisted variables. That's one of the early indications I mentioned a little while ago that when you have planar diagrams, they have this interesting, uh, they, they, they have a chance of having this interesting dual conformal symmetry. Okay, so if we wrote this in terms of, uh, if we wrote this in terms of momentum twisted variables, then we'd have D4ZA on the left, I would have some AB mod GL2. On the right, I have some CD mod GL2. And then I'd have a stack of these things. Down here, I'd have something like AB, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4. And then CD, 3, 4, 4, 1, 1, 2. And then an ABCD in front of everything. And then to make up all the weights, I guess it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, cubed. All right, so this, this form shows that the, each one of these two-loop diagrams by itself is something dual conformal invariant. <laughs> okay, some, uh, and is written explicitly as now an eight form on two copies of G24 or two copies of the space of lines in momentum twister space. 
OK. So now we're, we're finally ready to introduce the, the object that we're going to be uh, building up to. But uh, so, so let's talk about the all loop. All loop integrand for planar n equals four superang mills. So first, what is the object that we're talking about? So the object we're we're, we're talking about um, first, most naively, most naively, it's going to depend on. Um, so most naively, at L loops, it is a 4L form, 4 times L form. Um, and so my loop variables, I will, I will just call a, b, sub i, where i runs from 1 to L. So most naively, it's a 4L form, and it has uh, it has Grassmann weight four times k. So that's what we saw beforehand, just for the superamplitude in in general when we wrote it in momentum crystal space. Okay, and so what is the object? It depends on. I have m, which depends on the bosonic z's, the bosonic eta's, and it's a form in L of these variables. Okay, so here it's a, it's, a, it's a function of these variables. So here's a function of weight 4k. In these eta's, and it's a 4L form here. But if you remember, we've already learned to talk about this in a more geometric way, in a more, in a more interesting way, where we think about the superamplitude already as a form. Right? Remember, the way we turn it into a form is if we take this guy, we can, uh, up, we can just replace the eta, A, with the dz. And if we do that, now we have an object that's just a form. But uh, so this was a 4L form, but now this is going to be a 4 times L plus K form, which only depends, which is a form on the bosonic space of the Zs and the space of L copies of G24, L copies of lines in P3, L copies of points in space time. Okay, so that's the object we're going to be trying to uh, understand. Okay? We're not going to be the, doing the loop integrations for a while, <laughs> we, but we're going to get something at tree level. There's nothing to talk about other than the dependence on these zeds. At loop level, we're going to keep the dependence on these points that we'll later integrate over to get the uh, amplitude. But already, uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 there's a lot we can understand about the uh, the emergence of locality and unitarity and all sorts of things like that at this uh, more primitive level before we've carried out the uh, loop integration. So this is going to be the star of the show. That's a, this is the object that we're going to try to understand. As we go in the next few weeks, first of all, we will learn to just compute it. Okay, so we, uh, I already said briefly how to compute tree amplitudes using BCFW recursion relation. We, um, we deliberately didn't do too many examples because doing the examples will become much simpler in, in about a week's time when we have uh, some, uh, some Grassmannian technology under our control. Um, so already at all loop order, uh, uh, sorry, uh, already at tree level, it's possible to, to uh, uh, use recursion relations to actually compute this guy, say with L equals zero. There's an extension of these recursion relations to all loop order. Okay, so uh, if you want to sort of get data and do the uh, computations, 
Um, and uh, there's an extension of the BCFW recursions to all loop order. And uh, as we'll see, this is all connected with the Grassmannian structure that we'll start talking about in earnest next time. Um, uh, all the symmetries will be manifest. There's all sorts of nice things uh, already about that recursive computation. But these recursion relations are sort of a halfway point between the standard way of doing quantum field theory and this sort of new picture that we're trying to get. Um, they're a halfway point because you can ultimately, if somewhat indirectly, derive them from uh, field theory. But you still don't see this object as the answer to a different question that lives naturally directly in this space. Okay, so, okay, so what we'll then do is try to understand uh, that question. And that will lead us, so the story of the positive Rasmanian um, will be associated with a very physical picture of just gluing the basic three particle amplitudes together um, uh, in on shell processes. And as we explore that more and more, we'll be led, uh, uh, whether we like it or not, we'll be led to uh, encountering uh, Grassmannians and the positive Grassmannians. And after we're done with all of that, there's another step uh, to see what, uh, to see the question to which uh, this object is the answer, um, more intrinsically, we already saw before, uh, L equals zero and K equals one, we saw that this form had an interpretation as associated with the canonical form of a cyclic polytope. Okay, so you give me the momentum twister data, and there is a way of, uh, uh, of first of all, uh, thinking, of, uh, thinking about it as a canonical form associated with a certain cyclic polytope in this picture where we had these extra y's. Um, we then saw that it was somewhat slightly more abstractly associated with a picture directly in the momentum twister space um, uh, where we saw the, the avatar of the cyclic polytope uh, or the amphitohedron directly as a structure in the momentum twister space. So, um, so let me just uh, um, tell you what this final picture ends up looking like for this for this theory, just so um, uh, just so we have uh, an idea of what the uh, uh, destination is going to be in in uh, uh, two or three weeks. So now our kinematic space we're trying to uh, understand is now labeled by Z as well as these uh, ABs. Okay, so I have some I have some big kinematic space. Of course, it'll be great to get rid of the ABs and have a story just literally for the amplitude and not for this integrand, but that's what we have up in the moment. So this is our kinematic space, the space of Z and the space of these ABs. Okay, so the space is four times N, because we have a four dimensional momentum twisters. We have L of those guys, so it's four N plus N dimensional. And uh, it's the same basic structure that I talked about uh, last time. There is an interesting part in this space. There is a positive part in the space of, uh, of Zs and Abs. The positive part is fixed by the following requirements. Um, so P is fixed by the fact that as far as the Zs are concerned, all of the I, I plus one JJ plus ones are positive. Last time we saw how that positivity was associated with the positivity of Zs and so on. So, so um, I'm not expecting you to remember that, and all of this will be covered more systematically when we get there. I'm just trying to write down in one spot what the final answer is. Okay, so we're not you're not supposed to understand. It's not remotely supposed to be obvious that uh, that that this works. But this is just supposed to give you an, uh, an idea of what 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 the sort of hologram can uh, possibly look like in this case. Right. So. So we have to have the i plus 1, j, j plus 1 positive. But now I have to also tell you something about ABs. And it's the only thing that would make sense for every, well, let me call this index, too many indices here, uh, capital I, one from 1 to L. All of these uh, ABIs, i, i plus 1, are positive. OK? Uh, but this is not enough. Um, so. Uh, so this is a kind of a simple to interpret picture. Um, by putting AB here, what this is just telling me is that if I look at the configuration of Zs, which are four dimensional, if I project them through AB down to a two dimensional picture, I'll get a bunch of two vectors. 
and all the two vectors are sort of winding around one to the next in the same direction. Okay, so that's uh, okay. So this is telling them that they're all these i plus one, j j plus ones are all positive. Uh, they're all oriented positively relative to uh, each other. But there's also one more condition, um, which is just for the i plus one, j j plus ones, and these are the things that are more uh, slightly more. Mysterious. Um, so this collection of simplices, i i plus one, j j plus one. So this is a collection of simplices in uh, P three. And as we've mentioned a few times, if you look at this uh, formally, the sum of all these i plus one, j j plus ones, is something with no boundary. So this is topologically the same as an S three. And so you can ask for what the winding number is of this configuration around the origin in S3. Okay, So you have to ask that the winding number, this is defining the positive part, that the winding number, this S3 winding number, should be maximal. And what that maximal number will end up being will now depend on k. There's naively no k in the problem yet. but you're going to I'm going to give you a k, okay? So for every k, it's maximal. I'll define what this uh, k is in a second and is actually given by this funny formula. The floor of k plus 3 over 2 choose 2. Similarly, you have to say, oh, sorry. I, I should have also said up here that the loops are mutually positive relative to each other as well. So those are the obvious positivity conditions. And then there's winding number conditions. And the next one is that if I project through any one of the ABs and I look at the simplices, the sum of ii plus 1 of the zeds projected through AB, so these are now two-dimensional pictures. This is, again, an S1. And the winding number should again be maximal and be given just by the floor of k plus 1 over 2. So this is a computation to see uh, that there are these maximal numbers come out. And now, um, what is k? Now I have to tell you what uh, k is. Um, so there are different sectors. So if you like, there, there are different sectors here. In this big kinematic space, there are different sectors that are, have everything sort of winding around in the same direction, both in the two-dimensional and the four-dimensional sense, everything positive relative to each other. and certain winding number. You have to specify some winding number in each one of these sectors. That's where the information about k comes in. Well, uh, that is associated with picking out a subspace. So there is a subspace here, S, which just lives in the z space. It's 4k dimensional. And it's specified. Um, the subspace is, uh, is, uh, uh, is specified by all the zeds that look like z a is some z star. And then you move in the direction of some k plane in the n-dimensional space. So this is the generalization of what I mentioned uh, quickly last time. So the data that labels this subspace is just specifying where you start this z star and this delta. So this is a 4 plus k by n matrix. And I have to ask that this 4 plus k by n matrix has all positive minors. So that's this positive Grassmannian condition we're going to start talking about more explicitly before uh, next time. But now, as a positivity condition on the kind of subspace that you're allowed to uh, talk about. Now, here's the interesting thing. Find any z star and any delta for which this is true. Anything, right, for which this is true. Then it will turn out that that configuration of z's that we see down here, z star itself, there is a maximum amount that it can wind around. Simply from the fact that it's possible to complete that z star into a bigger matrix, okay, um, there's a maximum amount that it can wind around. 
And that maximum number you can compute. And it just turns out to be these funny numbers. So I don't even have to tell you these numbers. All I have to do is just ask you to find a subspace uh, that makes it wind around as much as possible. That's it. OK? OK. So, so this is it. The, everything is on the board. Everything is, uh, everything is on the board in the, in the kinematic space of the momentum twisters and the loop momenta and the loop variables. In that kinematic space, we're finding some positive part that's also characterized by some topological information. We're finding this interesting family of subspaces. And if I intersect this positive part with the subspace, I get some region with an interesting boundary structure, because all these inequalities are enforcing some interesting boundary structure on it. That intersection is the all-loop amplitohedron. which uh, depends here on n, k, and l. Okay, so the intersection of this positive part with this subspace is the all-loop amplitohedron. And there is a 4k plus l form that lives on the whole space, but which has the property that when you pull it back to the subspace, it becomes the canonical form of that amplitohedron. And that completely determines it. Okay. So um, I haven't said anything. Uh, any of the other things I, I haven't talked about the positive Grassmannian explicitly. Uh, you don't have to know. In principle, everything is contained in these uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, definition, and you get an idea of the kind of structures we have to encounter when we don't have space-time, we don't have a Hilbert space, we don't have time evolution. Um, this is now a glimpse of the kind of thing that, we're, that we might be seeing instead. Right? Um, in this space that seems to have almost no structure in it at all, we managed to put a little bit of structure by finding ordering. The ordering was naturally associated with the notions of positivity that we'll explore uh, in much uh, greater length, um, uh, and which allows some topological ideas also to come to life. But we're looking for a form in this space that has singularities in very special places. Those special places are entirely dictated by this, uh, by this combinatorial and geometric question. Okay. So um, it's not supposed to be obvious. But uh, as we, uh, uh, when, when we come back to this after we understand everything else, we'll be able to see why it is that these conditions guarantee that there are poles only in the right spot, that it factorizes on the poles, that you have the right factorization at loop level as well to guarantee unitarity. All of these things uh, will just follow from everything which is written on this board. Okay? And so um, that's, uh, as I said, a sort of a, uh, a glimpse of what we'll see and be able to understand a lot more in three or four weeks. OK, but next time we'll um, come back and uh, properly introduce the positive Grassmannian that we didn't get to today. Uh, the subspace S is the yes. Control.